If you've been reading along with us, you will have transitioned from reading Matthew into reading Mark this week. And um, maybe you're, you've been caused to think when we think about the popularity of Jesus and Mark, it's kind of twigged your mind, right? Oh yeah, isn't that just like how popular Christianity is today in Canada? Uh, really, uh, you're probably thinking that, right? Just how popular uh, Christianity is and going to churches these days, especially amongst the younger generations, right? Uh, super popular these days. Of course, you know I'm uh, being sarcastic. Uh, no. <laughs> we see the popularity of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. We don't really see the popularity of Jesus um, in church attendance across Canada, uh, especially amongst younger generations. And yet, research is telling us that the younger generations especially are quite open to spiritual things, are quite open to, to matters of faith. Interestingly, there's an openness there that we're being told about in our day, uh, even amongst the youngest of generations that we think they've all given up on faith and spirituality. Not so. However, organized religion, we could say, has fallen on hard times. Institutional religion has fallen on harder times. So actually, the Gospel of Mark, as we start getting into it, and we're going to think about it a little bit today, is going to help us reflect on that. Uh, but before we get there, I've really got two sermons today, but I'll keep both short, uh, because I didn't want to pass from the Gospel of Matthew to the Gospel of Mark, if you've been reading along with us, uh, or even if you haven't been reading along with us, maybe you have a sense of why Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Why not just one gospel? And why are, there, why are they different? You know, they're talking about the same person, Jesus. Why are they different as you read them? Uh, maybe you noticed that. For example, getting into Mark this week. What happened to Christmas? <laughs> There's no Christmas story there in the Gospel of Mark. And in Mark, in fact, by the end of chapter 1, we are introduced to Jesus, and he's already doing miracles and teaching and stuff. Whereas, think back to how Matthew begins, you have the Christmas story, and you have a, quite, a, quite a few chapters before we really get into Jesus and his ministry and his teaching and his, his miracles and all of that. So, why do we have these different Gospels? And um, so, this kind of helps us reflect on it. You'll notice some differences between Matthew and Mark. What they come down to is that there are two different people writing, Matthew and Mark, but they actually have in mind two different groups of people that they're writing to. Now, we, we typically think Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the writers of the gospel, they're just writing to us, right? Uh, they didn't have that in mind. I don't think Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John had in mind, oh yeah, Clark Dixon is going to be reading this 2,000 years from now. I don't think they were thinking that. Uh, rather, what they were doing is they had a certain group of people in mind in their day to write to, and so they wrote with that in mind. So, for example, Matthew is really writing to people of his own faith tradition, Judaism. He's writing to people of that faith tradition back in that day to introduce them to Jesus. And that's why you have a lot in Matthew about this happened to fulfill. He's very often, especially in the early chapters, pointing out how Jesus is a part of our faith tradition, part of our Judaism faith tradition, that Jesus is a part of that and that he is rooted in our people, Matthew would want to say. Uh, he's rooted there, and so that's look at how the Old Testament points to him, uh, how the Hebrew Old Scriptures point to him. Uh, and also we have Matthew writing to people that he knows who have this sense of, in our religion, in our faith tradition, we listen to our religious teachers, our spiritual leaders. Now, you've heard me preach on those spiritual leaders and religious teachers recently, and especially from like Matthew chapter 23, where Matthew just rips them apart, right? <laughs> or Matthew doesn't, but Jesus rips them apart. Uh, and there's like a whole chapter of woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. And so it makes sense in the context of Matthew writing for those who have the sense of we listen to those people. And so Matthew's writing to say, wait a minute, Maybe you shouldn't be listening to those people so much. You should be paying attention to Jesus. He is the king of the kingdom. 
If you could summarize Matthew's teaching uh, in, in what he wants to communicate in his gospel, in his account of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, it would be, Jesus is the king of the kingdom. And we being good Jewish people, we're all well-versed in what that kingdom is, but Jesus has come to redefine that for us and to help us, help us live it, help us enter into it. And so Jesus is the king of the kingdom. That's Matthew. Now Mark, on the other hand, he's more writing to kind of anyone and everyone. And he's also the most concise gospel. He's the shortest of the four gospels. Uh, he just gets straight to business. He, basically, if you wanted to summarize Mark's approach, he's introducing us to Jesus. He's giving us, if you could use the expression, the essential Jesus. Uh, the essential Jesus. Everything you need to know about Jesus and nothing you don't need to know. Here is the essential Jesus, and it is a concise report. Now, Mark, we don't think that Mark was with Jesus as Jesus was teaching and doing miracles and whatnot. Mark wasn't a witness to all the events that he describes, but typically Bible scholars think that Mark hung out with Peter a lot. And Peter was going around preaching and teaching and would have said a lot about the stories of Jesus, what Jesus said, what Jesus did. And so what we have in Mark is basically taking a lot of that knowledge about Jesus that he picked up from Peter, who was with Jesus, who was an eyewitness, and so Mark is taking that and basically summarizing it, making it concise, fitting it into 16 chapters. Although Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John would have no ideas of chapters and verses back in those days. They were just writing, right? Uh, that came much, much later to have chapters and verses. But Mark, he's basically giving us everything you need to know from the teaching of Peter. Uh, this is Jesus. So that's Mark's intention, that anyone and everyone, whether somebody be Jewish or not, would be able to respond to Jesus. Mark wants to introduce us to Jesus. And so that is what he does. And so let's get into that introduction to Jesus a wee bit this morning and see what, uh, what we can learn. And what we really get impressed upon us, especially this past week's readings, is just how popular Jesus was. If in Matthew, we get the sense of Jesus is the king of the kingdom, well, in Mark, we get more of a sense that Jesus is a bit of a, shall we say, superstar. Uh, this guy is uh, he's well known and well liked. Everybody loves him. Well, let's, let's take a look at some of the verses that, uh, that just come up on that. Mark chapter 1, um, Jesus does a miracle. He, he, he heals a man who has an unclean spirit. And then chapter 1, verse 28, at once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. So this idea of fame getting, getting spread around. And then Peter goes to Simon Peter's house and does a miracle there. And then in verse 33, and the whole city was gathered around the door. So we have the sense of everybody's learning what Jesus is doing. They're flocking to him already. We're only halfway through chapter one. And then we have Jesus cleanses a leper later after that. And then just a few verses. But he went out and began to, well, and, and Jesus told this leper, don't go tell anyone. Go talk to the, to the guys at the temple. Tell them uh, as a witness to them. But don't go telling anybody else. But this man went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the word so that Jesus could no longer go into a town openly, but stayed out in the country. And people came to him from every quarter. So again, this popularity of Jesus, despite Jesus saying, don't, don't tell anybody about me. He's trying to keep a lid on his popularity, but it's not working. Next, Jesus heals. So we're now into chapter two, a paralytic. And so many gathered around the door that there was no room for them, uh, not even at the front door. And Jesus is teaching. And that's when you have this, uh, these guys come and there goes my, my sermon notes. Uh, then you have these guys come bringing their friend and they dig a hole in the roof construction was different back then. They dig a hole in the roof and lower the man down because there's no room. Uh, again, the popularity of Jesus, people are there flocking to him. Uh, a little later, um, we have Jesus calling Levi, Matthew. And, and so we have these verses in fifth, uh, verse 15. And as he sat, that is, as Jesus sat at dinner in Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were sitting with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. So there were many of these people who were considered outcast were following Jesus. And we get the sense of Jesus being popular with everyone, including people who are outcast. 
And uh, flipping the page, we have some more here. When Jesus uh, departed with his disciples to the sea, a great multitude from Galilee followed him, hearing what he was doing. Then came to him in great numbers from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, uh, beyond the Jordan, and the region around Tyre and Sidon. And so we have all these people coming, and Jesus is like, get me into a boat so these people don't crush me. And that was from our scripture focus today. And we have people with uh, demon possession here, and the demons are screaming, we know who you are. And Jesus sternly ordered them not to make him known. So here we have Mark in presenting Jesus. We have Jesus being super popular, uh, and his fame is spreading. People are gathering in droves to see him, to touch him, to be healed by him. And yet we have Jesus himself trying to keep a lid on things. And when we think about Jesus, we have to wonder, you know, what kind of a marketing strategy did he have? <laughs> you know, what kind of hype, uh, producing hype was he trying to do? Uh, what kind of exercise in brand awareness was he, was he getting into, to use some language we might use today in marketing terms? And the answer is, his marketing strategy was to try to keep a lid on it all and not become well-known at all. Uh, because, well, he knew. Uh, the dangers of people, uh, how this would go and would lead to his crucifixion, which eventually it did. And he did not want that to happen before it was time. Uh, it would take three years for it to happen. It could have happened uh, in three weeks had things gotten out of proportion too quickly. Uh, so there we have Jesus has no marketing strategy apart from trying to keep it all quiet. Super popular despite Trying to, trying to keep it all clamped down. So doesn't that remind you of Christianity today? Despite our greatest efforts to clamp it all down, it's just so super popular. Uh, you know, I'm being sarcastic again. So it's interesting there. Is there anything that we can learn from Math Mark's account of Jesus here, the popularity of Jesus, despite the fact he didn't want to be popular? Is there anything we can learn from that that would help us in... Uh, with Christianity today. Well, one thing we want to notice is that Mark and also Matthew, Luke, and John, they did not write on, here's how you become a Christian, and here's what Christianity is about, and here's how you enter into this religion we call Christianity, and here's how it's done. Notice that the gospel writers do not do that. What is their focus? But simply, let me introduce you to Jesus. In Matthew's case, more for people of his own faith tradition background, let me introduce you to Jesus. And in Matthew's case, it's not a case of leave this religion called Judaism to join this religion called Christianity. It's simply... You and I are of the faith, same faith tradition. Let me introduce you to Jesus, and he has changed my religion. He will change yours too. Notice what comes first. It's not, you should become a Christian and follow this religion because it's better than that religion. It is, no, you and I are of the same religion, but let me tell you about Jesus and how he's changed my religious perspective. You see, it's we maybe sometimes do things a little backwards. And in Mark, it's not a case of, here, here's Christianity, here's how you become a Christian, here's how you do it. It's, here's Jesus. Here's Jesus. Let him impact your life. And by the way, that's going to impact your religious life too. See, it's not promotion of religion. It's not promotion of Christianity. It's promotion of Jesus which then later on gets worked out in changing people's religious perspective. You see the difference there? There's a bit of a difference there. And so in those early days of Christianity, it's not like, it's not like the Christian religion became this thing that became popular, but rather it was that this teaching about this Jesus, who is this Jesus? Tell us more about this Jesus. That's what became popular. That became the important thing. And then people's religious perspective would follow after that. It was all about Jesus. 
That was the main thing. And perhaps that's a, a good challenge for us in our day when people aren't into organized and institutional religion. Our goal isn't actually to introduce them to religion and get them to become religious. It can sometimes sound like it is. Like we package it in marketing terms. Let me, let me tell you why you should get hyped about what Christianity is. Is that our goal? Or is our goal actually to help people become aware of Jesus? Knowing that as people start to learn more about Jesus, become aware of Jesus, that's going to actually impact their religion and change things up for them, just as it does for us. So the question is, where's our excitement? Is our excitement about Christianity that we've looked at all the world's religions and we think, yeah, Christianity is a good one. And well, Christianity comes along with Jesus. So maybe I should learn something about Jesus. Or is it a case of there's this man, Jesus, and because of Jesus, we know, we know so much about the love of God. It's through Jesus that we learn about God. So we get excited about Jesus, and therefore Christianity becomes a thing that is helpful to us in getting to know Jesus and in following Jesus. You see the difference there? Are we hyped about Christianity and, oh yeah, maybe at some point I'll learn about Jesus? Or are we excited about Jesus and therefore we start learning about Christianity? There's a difference there. And I think a lot of times, people especially who are raised in Christian circles can treat it like that religion, that it's one religion amongst many, and maybe they don't even know that much about Jesus, when really it's all about Jesus. It's about him. I had a bit of experience with that in my own life where you could have called me a Pauline Christian, that my favorite books of the Bible to read were like Ephesians and Romans because they were highly theological and just it really exercised my brain, I guess. I liked that until I started reading the New Testament in, in Greek. And uh, then I gravitated towards reading Mark, especially John, especially because it's the easiest Greek of the entire New Testament. Uh, narrative is so much easier to read in Greek than like what Paul's writings are, which are more theological. Narrative is easier. So I started reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John more. And it was through that experience where I was kind of like, wait a minute, this really is about Jesus. <laughs> now that sounds strange to hear that from a Baptist pastor, right? That at some point in my, it was after I went to seminary and started learning Greek that I twigged in, actually, this really is about Jesus. No, it really is. And it's not about actually Paul's teaching. It's about Jesus and Paul's just helping us get Jesus. So our goal isn't to understand Paul for the sake of understanding the Apostle Paul. Our goal is to read the Apostle Paul to help us understand Jesus. Our goal isn't to read Revelation for the sake of understanding Revelation. Our goal is to read Revelation for the sake of understanding Jesus. You see the point, I could pick any book of the Bible and do that. It's not about those books of the Bible. It's, it's all about Jesus. He is the center of our faith. I am a Christian, not a Christian Christianitian. Okay. I'm not a Christianitian. I'm a Christian. I'm not a follower of the religion Christianity. I'm a follower of Jesus. And this religion called Christianity has, is supposed to help me do that. And I think it does but we don't want to put the cart before the horse. And maybe sometimes we do that. I'm way off my sermon notes here and I have no idea where I'm supposed to be here. All right. My apologies on that. There's also a sense too that, you know, pe people aren't into organized religion and institutional religion at the moment especially the younger generations, that's okay. Because we have the opportunity to help them have an awareness of Jesus and then see where that leads uh, as, a, as, a, as according to what religion they pick up on or how, what that Christianity looks like for them. Make, create an awareness of Jesus there. 
But also another thing we could say is there's a great misunderstanding of the Bible, how it works and what it is, both inside Christian circles and beyond. There's a great misunderstanding about that. And so this is again another opportunity to bring it back to Jesus. Because sometimes how we promote Christianity is we promote the Bible. And you get kind of a sense of, well, if only we could find Noah's Ark on some mountain somewhere, we could prove that every word of the Bible is true. And people would have to believe it, right? Wouldn't that be great? Or if we could find all kinds of chariots at the bottom of the Red Sea, we could prove that that whole Red Sea thing happened and people would have to believe the Bible then, right? That's not actually what we're supposed to be doing as Christians. Our goal isn't to prove that the Bible is true in every word. Our goal is to help people become aware that Jesus is real. See the difference there? Our goal isn't to prove that the Bible is true. Our goal is to prove that Jesus is real. And then from that, then we go back and say, okay, how does the Bible, how does that fit into our faith? And what is it and how does it work? Where sometimes people in promoting Christianity are really promoting the Bible. It's a promotion actually of Jesus, an awareness of Jesus. And let our thoughts about the Bible follow that rather than lead that. Because that becomes a big stumbling block for people too. Especially when we get too, you've heard me preach on this before, too excited about preaching. Oh, I can prove that the world was created in six literal 24 hour periods of time. No young person is going to go for that really. Um, maybe there are a few who are steeped in that, but no. Um, you know, again, our goal isn't to present people, get, get people to believe the Bible. Our goal is to create in people an awareness of Jesus, trust in Jesus, and then our thoughts about the Bible will follow that, just as our thoughts on Christian religion will follow that. To put Jesus first, to put Jesus first. Now, there are a couple of stumbling blocks in the way, just as there was in Mark's day and in Matthew's day when they're writing their Gospels. Uh, there were a couple of stumbling blocks, and it was the Apostle Paul said that, uh, that the, the cross of Jesus Christ is a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. And so those people who are from the Jewish background would say, well, if Jesus was crucified, what kind of a Messiah is that? That's ridiculous. So that's a stumbling block to the Jews, but also foolishness to the, to the Gentiles. They're like, um, you yeah, this idea of God coming to us and dying. And, anyway, they just say it's, that's kind of weird and foolish. So a, a stumbling block and foolishness, and it can be to people today, this idea of, of Jesus can be a bit of a stumbling block and foolishness. And uh, what do I mean by that? Well, when people get so steeped in a modernist way of thinking, by modernist way of thinking, what I'm referring to there is kind of this idea that we can know things but the only way we can know things is through science. That's really a modernist way of thinking. And so that becomes a huge stumbling block to people coming to faith in Jesus, to trust in Jesus. Uh, because this idea of, well, you can't learn about Jesus through science, therefore it didn't happen, or therefore we can't know about it. And so when people get steeped in that modernist way of thinking, that's where creating an awareness of who Jesus is and what Jesus was like and how Jesus helps us know God, that becomes very difficult. I've used this illustration once before. It's, um, you know, if I get on my motorcycle and head down the 401, which can be very straight and flat and boring, so I don't like to do it. Um, but if I was riding that motorcycle and if you were to take, you know, 30 seconds of time and you were to study what a motorcycle is and what it does, you would probably learn that what a motorcycle does is get me from one point to another quite quickly. What you would not realize is that motorcycles can turn. And so if you were just studying it and realizing I'm just going a straight line in those 30 seconds, you, you might miss out on the fact that there's something more to learn about motorcycles, that they turn and they turn very well. And that's actually, that's much more fun on a motorcycle than going in straight lines. You would miss all that. And that's a bit like the modernist way of thinking where science itself is like taking all of, all of time and being able to look at that much of it and study it. 
And there's so much that gets missed out that science just can't teach us. I love, I forget who said it first, but somebody said, science doesn't actually teach us anything. It's scientists who teach us things. But there's only so much that they can learn about because there's only, there's, there's only so much. It's like studying that motorcycle under just 30 seconds of time. You miss out on a lot. And so science misses out on a lot. It can't tell us about God, apart from indirectly. There are certain ways it can tell us, teach us some things about God indirectly. But there's certain things it cannot teach us. One thing science can't teach us is history. And so we depend upon historians to teach us. And that's where, again, back to Jesus, where science isn't going to teach us about Jesus, but history is. And using good historical method will help us help create an awareness about Jesus, that he actually did exist. And, and yeah, what are we to make of Jesus and how he changed history? Uh, so so that's, that's one roadblock and to create an awareness of Jesus is this idea of modernism. The other ro roadblock is to... Um, go with postmodernism, uh, which follows modernism. And it's this kind of idea that, well, we can't know anything. Uh, we can't know anything. And so a lot of people have this postmodernist idea. We can't, we can't know things, but we can still be religious. Just pick one that helps you and become spiritual. Yeah, we can do that, but just pick something that's it's really utilitarian. Just pick whatever fits you, whatever works for you. So we would want to say, we'd want to say that's a roadblock because again, like the modernists, we want to say you can know things. Yeah, we can know things and we can learn things about Jesus from doing good historical work, from getting into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the rest of the New Testament. We can learn things about Jesus, the, the truth, the reality of Jesus. You, we can learn about that. And so it's not just postmodernism that you can't know anything. Yeah, there are things you can know. So we want to draw upon our uh, brothers and sisters in the modernist world and say, yeah, they, they're right about some things. We can know truth. But then to the modernist, we want to say, hey, we want to learn some things from the postmodernists and say, you can't know everything. Uh, so we want to draw a bit from modernism and postmodernism and be able to just create an awareness and watch out for the stumbling blocks in people's lives today that they can't meet Jesus because they've written him off. We can't learn about him from science or they can't be, have an awareness of Jesus because, oh, well, we can't know anything anyway. So I'm just going to pick a religion that fits me. We want to say to that, let's create an awareness of Jesus, that there are good reasons to believe in Jesus. There are good reasons to trust in Jesus. And like Matthew and like Mark, to focus on, let's, let's introduce you to Jesus. Jesus was hugely popular despite the fact he tried to keep it all quiet and keep a lid on it. Christianity on our day is hugely not popular despite best efforts to kind of increase it in our day through evangelism and whatnot. Maybe something we can learn from Mark. Let's focus on introducing people to Jesus. Make it about him. It's not actually about getting people into the Christian religion. It's not about getting people to, to believe the Bible. It's actually about introducing people to Jesus. Perspectives on religion and perspectives on the Bible will follow that. Nowhere in the New Testament we, do we see uh, this idea of this is what a Christian is and here's how you get into it, but rather we just have if Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Here's Jesus. Let me introduce you to him. Can we be doing that? There's one more roadblock, just to finish off, for people being introduced to Jesus, and that is when we, we're lacking excitement about Jesus. There was great excitement about Jesus that we read about in Mark. Do we have that? Let's pray.